Welcome to Nothing Exempt. My name is Nick Pardini, and I am with my co-host, Brian Piotr, and a special guest, Daniele Boelli, from the History on Fire podcast, which, especially given how infrequent Dan Carlin releases podcasts, is one of the better podcasts out there in the whole category of history. Uh, in the Before we get started, I'd just like to mention that the show is brought to you by the Cause and Effect Report. The Cause and Effect Report is a macro research newsletter which helps explain what's going on in the financial markets and the world economy in an actionable way for traders and investors. As a disclaimer, this, nothing on this show is investment advice, nor is the Cause and Effect Report, so you need to still do your own research on top of that. With that out of the way, uh, let's get started with our guest. Brian, what's your first question for Danielle? Okay, my first question is a statement, and that is that the History on Fire podcast is my favorite podcast, and I could get rid of podcasts in general if that one wasn't on there. Uh, Dan Carlin doesn't post enough anymore to get my history fix. And <laughs> and uh, if you haven't listened to History on Fire, I suggest starting with uh, the... the um, Juan Hernando de Cortez series on the conquest of Mexico that is just a, an amazing story that you can't turn off and so my, my first question of the day is of all the, all the different parts of history that you've read about where would you like to live if you could choose another time to live in to be born into I think it's the where and when is uh, relative to your position in society because, you know, there are some places that are pretty awesome if you're at the top. They are not quite that fun when you are, you know, if you are a Mexica emperor, life is pretty good. If you are the Mexica captive who gets sacrificed on top of a pyramid having their heart ripped out of their chest, not so fun. You know, okay. but, but if you could pick if you could pick the very top someplace, where would you be? I think like purely in terms of personal fascination, I'm intrigued with tribal life. So I'm intrigued with the kind of life that we all had way back when in the day. So before states, before agriculture, hunting and gathering in some, uh, I'm fascinated with that. And that of course, uh, you, you know what, actually, if we want to refine it a tiny bit, probably the best deal they had was uh, Native Americans after having horses. So they had the best of hunting and gathering life, but because they had horses, they could uh, do it on a much grander scale. So it's you have all the benefits of being a hunter and gatherer without all the limitations. So I think like Native life around the end of the 1700s, early 1800s on the Great Plains sound like a lot of fun. Okay, now... Yeah. All right. The uh, first thing I was going to ask is what got you into history in the first place? It's kind of how I learned how to read as a kid. I remember reading on these books that were children books. So they were, you know, illustrated and they would give you a visual of what the stuff that they were talking about. And to me, it was super fascinating. It was just a way to let my imagination go and figure out what it would be like to be uh, a person living in ancient Egypt 3,000 years ago or being in the Roman legions or in whatever other context the books are about. So to me, it was never, a, oh, you're studying history. It's kind of like a well, game that I picked up as a very young kid. And so that's what I found fascinating with it. Yeah, I, l I like the quote that uh, fiction has nothing on history, and I don't remember who said that, but it, yeah, it's so man. very true. The, the the most interesting things that you can write about are already happened. It's already happened. Yeah, there's so much crazy stuff out there. Um, I did an episode at one point about the comparisons between Game of Thrones and actual historical events. And, you know, when you look at some crazy stuff on Game of Thrones, where you're like, "Oh, come on, that could not be possible," and you see in history how stuff like that happens all the time. Well, minus the dragons. No dragons in history. But other than that, the rest is all dead on. Yeah, I mean, the reason I got involved in history because I was just curious about why things the way they were. Yeah. And history explains that. And since a lot of the reason why we have certain issues in society today, I think is because people don't understand the history and the context on why things are the way they are. Uh, but the thing, next thing I was going to ask is, what current figure you think would make them for the, for the most interesting history on fire episode 50 to 100 years from now? 
Uh, current. Let me think. What are we thinking of today? Uh, I'm not particularly interested in any of the classic figures that you normally, you know, the politicians, that kind of stuff. I don't see anything particularly captivating. Uh, I think there are more, um, on a personal level, I'm more interested in people who have done amazing things from sports to arts to other things, you know, from the Michael Jordan to the that kind of thing more than the classic uh, political dimension of history. Well, it, since since you haven't been interested in the, the classic political dimension, uh, if you had, if somebody forced you to read a 500 page biography on a politician and you had to pick your uh, easiest one to pick, who, who would you want to read about? I think the one that I actually got to do when I had a great fun uh, was doing uh, was covering Theodore Roosevelt, because Theodore Roosevelt was unlike most American presidents or presidents from most countries. It's such a crazy, insane, wild life that him being president of the United States was almost secondary. It was almost like, oh yeah, by the way, he was also president of the United States. You know, it's just everything else about him was so like come on, you got to be kidding me type of thing at every other page where he makes for a really fascinating figure. I uh, can't really say the same about a whole lot of modern politicians, but uh, Roosevelt was so much fun to cover. The, there's a lot of characters around that same time period that are just I- extravagant, like uh, Ferdinand mm-hmm. de Lesseps uh, from France who, who built the Suez Canal. He was another right. one with tons of kids and just did crazy things in his life. As yeah. There was something about that time period that made it an exciting time to be alive. Definitely. No, there's, uh, and I mean, even now, it definitely is an exciting time to be alive. I just, I think it's happening more in other dimension compared to the political one. I think right now the political one, there's a general sense across the globe of disillusionment, because with greater access to information, we realize that a lot of the stuff that we have been sold is fake, it's image, you know, mo- across the world, most people just hate professional politicians now. I mean, if you look at like the American elections, the last few rounds, they clearly show that, you know, from Obama, who had relatively little political experience, then you get people like Trump, who had downright no political experience. The message is always kind of is the same, is people are just so turned off with politics that they would be in a anything but kind of mode. Yeah. Uh, that's dangerous in itself, but it's uh, but that's the current mode. Is this general sense of cynicism that has followed post 1960s as kind of the veil has been lifted and we got to see what's going on behind the, um, behind the curtains and many people are bad with it. Yeah, I mean, how do you think like a Teddy Roosevelt would be able to if if he was president now? Would he, how would he be able to handle things? I think, I mean, even back then, he was president by chance, really. They were just trying to get rid of him being governor of New York. His own party was trying to get rid of him being governor of New York because he didn't play by the rules. He wasn't a classic politician. And they figured, what's the best way to kill the career of a popular politician where we can just kill it outright? Well, we'll give him the job of vice president because vice president is the place where political careers go to die anyway, so doesn't matter. And that made perfect sense until somebody shot McKinley and suddenly the vice president just became president and the guy you are hoping to disappear somewhere just became president of the United States. So I think even back then it was a chance. I think even back then he was a guy who did not fit the mold of politicians before him or after him. And he was at odds with everybody, uh, with the opposition, with his own party, with everything. Yeah, that's funny you say that because the last two presidents that came into power via assassination um, were kind of people who people, they tried to push them aside. They ended up being some of the more influential presidents in history, with the case of Teddy Roosevelt and also Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. I wonder if you had a chance to read Robert Caro's series on the I years mean, of Lyndon Johnson. Not. Uh, I, if you have time for an audiobook series, I just I rec- highly recommend that one. Like, but he's but it's hard to recommend that that book because well, it's four series and each one is about a hundred and twenty hours of audiobook. <laughs> <laughs> That's some serious commitment right there. <laughs> yeah, you don't lightly offer that to to somebody. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, Robert Caro is somebody who uh, has never learned the art of brevity, but is is a great writer. Is a great writer. Right. Yeah, I mean, you would be surprised that Lyndon Johnson kind of came from absolutely nothing and basically was used his political connivingness to get up to the top. Mm-hmm. And he was I don't he was not necessarily a good person and I don't agree with necessarily with his political views, but he was probably the most effective politician in the twentieth century. Crazy though that he ended up being only a one term guy that yeah. you know, I couldn't even run a second term. Well, uh, the nice, like everybody likes Kennedy, and the main reason for that is he didn't accomplish anything, and then he was shot in office. Yeah, I mean, of course, but it's but kind if, of like. But if you do things, people don't like you. If you do absolutely yeah, nothing, course. everybody likes you. Yeah, so it's that, like the rock star who dies at twenty-eight, right? It works well because you have one, two records at most. You are at your peak, and boom, and then you're gone. And everybody remember the highlights, and there's not even the time to see the downward slope. Do you think that's part of the reason why Alexander the Great is so well regarded in history? Right, because it's like he did conquer left and right, boom, dead. Next, yeah, of course, short lives when they are powerful and intense, they present less contradictions. Yeah. My next question actually is, what do you think is the most interesting counterfactual in history? In which way? What do you like, mean? what if something went a different way? Oh, like, yeah. Do you ever think about that? Sure. There's um, there's a really interesting one, one of those what-ifs that's really bizarre. Back from, like, about 2,700 years ago or so, there was uh, this one. Uh, the Assyrians were about to lay siege to Jerusalem. They had already demolished uh, the one half of the Jewish kingdom. They were after the other half. They had destroyed just about everything there was to destroy. And all that was left was Jerusalem. And by all logical accounts, they should have been able to take over. And, you know, and if they did, if they had taken over Jerusalem at that time, there would be no Judaism. Because Judaism would have been wiped off the face of the earth. Without Judaism, of course, there would be no Christianity. And without Christianity, there would be no Islam either. So the entire history of the world would be completely different. And it all flipped on this one siege, which theoretically speaking should have worked for the guys, the Assyrians setting up the siege, they had everything going for them. So logically speaking, there shouldn't be any of the major Western religions should not exist. And it was kind of random, I mean, hard to say coincidence because it's like things happen for a reason, but uh, a very low probability event took place that allowed the Jewish kingdom to survive, that allowed them to gain the sense that even deeper rooted commitment to their religion so that even when they were demolished, they kind of held on to it and were able then to pass it on to Christianity and Islam. But think about it, like somebody in a, in a siege that nobody remembers today could have completely changed the entire history of the world. Wow, I did not know about that. Did you do a podcast on it yet? No, I haven't done it because I would. I need to do my homework on it. I don't know how much material there is. Like, if it's just make for a cool story in fifty minutes, or if there's enough to go on for an hour and enough. Uh, but yeah, it's a crazy story. Yeah, I mean, I just think the thing is, the Babylonians conquered them about sixty to a hundred years later. I don't know the exact yeah. time frame, but. Do you think that that would have been able, the religion would have survived that one? So I'm wondering if it would have survived anyway. Well, the reason why they probably wouldn't have is because that event, the fact that they survived a siege where all the odds were against them, created an extra sense of God is on our side. We have this deep, because what had happened was the Assyrians wiped out the other half of a Jewish kingdom, and those guys just you know, you know them as the lost tribes of Israel because their identity disappeared. You know, I'm sure they survived genetically, but in terms of their Jewish identity was gone completely. Part of the reason why they were able to hold on to their identity after the Babylonians conquered is precisely because there was this rising fervor having survived the first siege by the Assyrians. And so then even when they would lose, and they did lose plenty afterwards, they weren't going to give up on their traditional religions as much as they would have had a hundred years before. Okay, I did have one more question moving in a different direction, and that is, um, 
what's your favorite way to consume history right now? Is it books or Audible or podcasts? podcasts? Yeah, oh, podcasts. Yeah. Um, my, I mean, I read a ton of history because I have to. Most of the time, it's not that fun. It's like kind of digging for gold. You know, you're just panning and you mad, mad, mad. Oh, little gold nugget. That's great. I'm going to use that. So the podcasts tend to do that for you already. They tend to already focus on the highlights, on the things that capture your attention in two hours rather than having to read uh, 600 pages on something. And then not even 600 pages because you have to read, it's not that you read one book and you're done. You have to read a whole bunch of them to really understand the whole thing. Podcasts tend to, they are a little more manageable that way. Yeah, my next question is, what do you think is the biggest misconception in history out there? Um, <laughs> there's a bunch. Trying to think of, uh, I think one of the things that happen a lot is that people, as much as we know that stuff happened before our time, people tend to take things for granted that history was supposed to take us here that this is sort of the logical, that there's this forward progress that's going to continue forever in terms of technological development and everything else. And I think um, and I think people have a tendency to take for granted their surroundings a little too much, like not really understanding that the overwhelming majority of the human experience has been lived by people who had a material life, priorities, ideas that were nothing like ours today that our society is uh, a dot in time, uh, that most of the human experience is something else entirely. Well, well most, of the, most of the human experience in terms of history, yes, but in terms of man years, maybe not at this point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the age is different, yeah. Yeah, there's so many more people that the number of hours adds up so much faster. For sure. Yeah. Well, I think uh, also like a part of that is, is that what is the definition of progress is defined by who won history. Yeah. So maybe like if, for example, if the Germans say won World War One, and they changed the world in a different way, let's say there wasn't a second world war, or there wasn't like a country of Israel, or there wasn't a USSR, and there's a variety of other different things that happened, then that might be considered a different kind of progress. Right. Or like if the countries were, or if a different world power so the united states was in charge and china was the dominant country and well a lot, a lot of their policies that people find as regressive today in our society might be considered progressive if history won a different way well and the thing is it will go a different way because no, nobody stay on top forever so it's inevitable that that's going to be the case where you know there will be the decline of the united states and somebody else will come on as a major power and you know, it's just a matter of, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But it's okay not to be a major power. I mean, Brit Britain is going on a thousand years of, uh, since the Magna Carta, well, yeah, 800 that's years. A, that's a good way to decline. They had it good. You know, they, they didn't have the collapse where they go from number one to the Dark Ages. They had a, a gentle slope, so that's much better. Yeah, another thing I was going to ask you a little bit on a different topic is I, the first time I actually heard of you is through your interview on Thaddeus Russell's podcast. Mm -hmm. And you are very into, um, so what got you into podcasting and martial arts? Because I noticed your interest in martial arts is reflected by a lot of the types of podcasts you do in History on Fire. Sure. Um, as far as uh, podcasting, I got into in 2011. I didn't know anything about podcasting. And I was invited because of something, a book I'd written, and I was invited on the Joe Rogan podcast. And so that was kind of a deep dive uh, quickly because Rogan had such a huge popular podcast even back then. And so that kind of helped me realize what's out there, the potentials of the medium and everything else. As far as martial arts, um, I always like them. I always, uh, um, you know, by nature more nerdy and read a lot. And so it was nice to balance it out with something very different, with something more where nobody cares what you're thinking or how verbally you can express yourself is about what you can do with your body under pressure. And so uh, that appealed to me. That was, uh, that was something that appealed to me in terms of giving another side to my personality. And it never really stopped. You know, I started martial arts training, I think, when I was 17 or so, and, you know, still today. 
Okay. Uh, my one last question would be, is there anybody who, as soon as they release content, whether that be a book or a podcast, you just stop what you're doing and you go right into it and with no break? Like you would wait in line at a store to pick up a book if they had one. Is there anybody like that that you follow? Yeah. Yeah, one of my favorite humans is definitely Dan Carlin. Um, he's just such a, not only the content, I mean, his content is great, but I just like him as a person, you know. He's just a good human being. He's just really sweet, really smart. Uh, I always, whether I fully agree or not with him all of the time, I enjoy, like, he's one of those guys that he could be just reading the phone book and I would be perfectly happy listening to Dan Carlin read the phone book, you know. It's like, like lately, for example, some of the latest hardcore history have been a little less into it than some of the other ones because I feel that he has focused more on the big picture rather than characters. And I'm very character driven. I like to have, like, for example, he did a series, uh, I think, an episode recently about Caesar fighting the Gauls. And, you know, you have some great characters there, and he had explored them so well in the past with the Roman Republic. And here he's playing more kind of a bird-eye view of the events. So it's a little less my style, what I would be into, but it doesn't matter. It's Dan Carlin, and he's great. So it's like, you know, I, I really, really, the content becomes almost secondary now for me. With, uh, when it comes to Dan, I just enjoy whatever he puts out. I, yeah. did, I did like the 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 explanation of the different fighting in Gaul and all the things that Caesar did. Mm -hmm. um, having listened to the whole History of Rome podcast, it was nice to go into... It almost felt like it was the opposite of bird's eye view compared to History of Rome. It was very in-depth, but it was a middle level in between that and just investigating one individual. Yeah, I guess what, what I meant... Yeah, you're right. Is bird eye view is probably the wrong term. It's more like... Yeah, not character driven. It was very tactics and logistics and things that are a little more impersonal. I guess that would probably be the better way to describe it. Whereas I tend to, most of the history I dig is uh, I need to feel that I'm there. I need to feel that I'm looking through somebody's eyes kind of feeling. So characters, I, I find them key in storytelling. I have a very hard time telling good stories unless I have some characters to latch on to. Yeah, I mean, uh, speaking of now that we kind of, I'm thinking about an interesting, I don't know much about him because I'm American, but a guy who seems to be a modern figure who would be an interesting guy for History on Fire is Silvio Berlusconi. You might have more perspective on it because you're from Italy, but. Yeah, it's weird. It's part of this trend that's going on globally of people who are, um, I'm trying to put, a, put it delicately, but basically there's a, fascin a global fascination for authoritarian figures who can play the strong man who can show up and say everything has gone wrong but don't worry i'm the strong guy who's here to defend you and they are bombastic and over the top and very flamboyant kind of in the way and i'm not comparing the policies or politically or making but kind of the way like even in the past of italy a guy like mussolini was where you know he was a fascist dictator there's no argument but his appeal was the sense of like, I'm the great strong man who's going to uh, make Italy amazing and everything is going to run on time and all of that. And I think it's, I see it all over right now because yeah, guys like Berlusconi from Putin to Duarte in the Philippines, Erdogan in Turkey, Trump. There's this popular fascination for uh, the guy who looks like I will be the one who defend you. I will make America or Turkey or the Philippines great again, that kind of thing, you know. And and I think it's a product of people being scared that, you know, we at a time of very fast change where things are changing really fast, where you feel that the ground under your feet is shifting constantly and you're not sure where to go next, how quickly the culture, the technology, everything is changing. People are very much drawn to somebody who can say, I'm going to make it all all right. Don't worry. And it's funny because when you look at Berlusconi, he was a straight up clown. I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous that anybody ever took him seriously. Because when you listen to him speak, he's just a man. I mean, it's painful oh, to listen. He was, right? he, was, he was a clown. Did he uh, happen to run a, a TV show where he uh, hired somebody at the end? 
Well, he no, I'm not just, quite. I'm just kidding. Right? Yeah, no, he was a media mogul. He owned multiple TV stations and stuff. But then the thing was, yes, okay, he's at a mess. But then you look at his opposition, and you're like, okay, this is supposed to be the alternative. Good God, they are just as just as crappy. And at least, okay, Berlusconi is gonna just drive you toward destruction. But at least you laugh along the way just because of the stupid things he says. Some of these guys are stupid bureaucrats who are going to still be fairly miserable and you don't laugh either. So, you know, you can see why, again, I don't like Berlusconi. I would never vote for him in a thousand years, but I can see the logic for why people did it. I mean, they kept they kept bringing him back over and over and over. He got busted having sex with underage prostitutes and all sorts of stuff. And nothing sticks. Doesn't matter, you know? Oh, yeah, that's why I thought he'd be a good idea for, like, a narrative, because he just has such a weird story. He keeps yeah. All this weird stuff happens to him, and, like, from an outsider point of view, I'm like, I, I, I mean, I kind of get his appeal from the populist point of view, but other than that, it's like, how did he get there so many times? And I think still- it's the alternatives, really, is that when you look at what the other side is, and their main selling point is, hey, we are not him, yeah, that's not a selling point. That just telling him, I, I knew already that he was terrible, but you're not really telling me why you're any good. Which is kind of what happened with the Trump-Clinton thing. You know, you end up with candidates that most people despise. You know, majority of people in U.S. are not big Trump fans, and majority of people in U.S. definitely don't like Hillary Clinton. And you get stuck with these choices where people are like, oh, you got to be kidding me. These are the choices I get. And, you know, when you look at Berlusconi's life, he has had uh, most of his political opponents were just painfully bad. And so even a guy who's a complete clown and does crazy things, he had the populist appeal. He's uh, as more media friendly in his approach. And so he he got the votes. Do you think that Italy, the Italian culture as a whole, is affected somewhat from the fact that their civilization relatively peaked with the Romans, or is that too ancient of history to affect the psyche today? Um, Italy, like most places that have been around a long time, tend to be kind of conservative in terms, I don't mean politically, but conservative in terms of uh, hostile to innovation. There's this tendency of, ah, we have seen it all already. What are you proposing, young man, kind of thing. So no tends to be the default answer to everything which of course is not very good when it comes to creating new things. You know, it's, uh, you may have even very good reason for saying no to something, but that's never, a, you know, you're not taking too many risks. Italy never take risks. It tends to be very old, very bureaucratic, very slow moving. And, and that's part of what happens with very ancient civilizations. I tend to see it in, not everywhere, but in a lot of places. I I think there's also something about in places where they have to have a bunch of compromise because Mm -hmm. there's vastly different parties that uh, things tend to not move just in general or they move very quickly. But if if there's equal opposition on each side, there tends to be a lot of log jamming, kind of like Congress. For sure. Definitely. Yeah, so like my after that sidetrack, my last kind of question is, who do you think is the most interesting character in history, either have you done them for a previous podcast or one that you haven't yet? One that I want to cover at some point that a guy I deeply love is this um, E.Q. Sojun. He was a Zen monk from the 1400s in Japan, and he was absolutely hilarious because uh, his main passions, he was very to the point and wasn't exactly hiding it. He was His passion in no particular orders were Zen, women, and alcohol. And uh, he's hilarious. Like when you read his stuff, he's just Bugs Bunny in a spiritual form, you know. Is uh, and the thing is, a lot of people like their booze and sex and stuff, but they do it in a very underhanded kind of way or in a manipulative kind of way. Or he was not at all. Nobody ever had a complaint with with him. There was no me too about EQ. It was more like. The guy's just very open. He likes likes sex. He likes booze. He likes uh, meditation. And uh, and reading him, I, I always I never fail to crack up reading his stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, well, 
when you're reading something that's translated from another language, do you choose English or do you choose Italian? Um, if, if you have an option, which probably depends. not, not often. Most of the time I read in English. There are things, however, that I'll find Italian sources that are better for what I'm doing. Not only if it's an Italian topic, but sometimes there are things that may be better translated. Or, like, for example, even forgot history, but reading philosophy. Uh, reading Nietzsche in English, I don't like it. I find it very old sounding and dry and kind of boring. There are a couple of Italian translations of Nietzsche that are brilliant. They are just. Oh, they're powerful, they're intense, you catch it right away. If I were to read it in English, I could not care less. I, I know how you feel. I, and other things like that, like Faust, gets translated into Old English. Yeah, terrible. Why? Terrib You're already translating it. Translate it to Modern English. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that stuff is awful. It's just, it kills all the intensity of the message. Yeah, I tend to agree with you guys, especially on things like Shakespeare and Chaucer. The only book I like in Old English is the King James Bible because it seems like with that type of book, it's meant to be in like old sounding text. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that. Yeah, sometimes though there are parts that would be like, for example, if you take in the Bible, you take the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, however it's referred to. In all the English, you kind of get that it's somewhat sexual, but it's very, like, what are they trying to say again? When you read it in a more modern version, you're like, oh, my God, this is straight up porn. This is just so sexually wild that it's, it catches you in a different kind of way, where you're like, wow, okay, I did not expect that in the Bible. Well, hey, there's, there's pretty much any kind of event in human history. There's some story in the Bible that is pretty graphic. People just yeah, don't yeah. go through it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you for spending so much time with us today. If any of our listeners want to find you, what are the best ways that they could go find you? Probably good old Google always helps. You know, if you figure out how to spell my name, which is a challenge, but still there are lots and lots of else in there. But, you know, there you'll find uh, History on Fire, uh, Drunken Taoist, uh, my books, uh, there's, you know, the, 7,000 things that I do or Twitter, public Facebook page, that kind of stuff Okay, well I'll save everybody a little bit of trouble and put your name right in the show notes so that they don't have to look anywhere else for it Sweet. And awesome. we'll put a link to History on Fire in there as well. Awesome, thank you guys so much. And Nick, is there anything you want to say before we close? Uh, no, if you want to find us, on, you can go to our Reddit page, at Nothing Exempt, or at Twitter, at, at Nothing Exempt, or you can email us at Nick at Nothing Exempt or Brian at Nothing Exempt. We always like having fan questions and hearing different opinions. Okay, thank you, and we'll talk to you next time.